Hello everyone, and welcome to Syskit's Office 365 offboarding webinar with the one and only Todd Clint. My name is Damir, and I'm a marketing specialist here at Syskit, and I will assist Todd today during the webinar. Todd doesn't need much of an introduction, but it doesn't hurt to mention that Todd has over 15 years of experience with SharePoint and Office 365. Todd specializes in infrastructure and administration topics and has spoken at conferences all over the world. Todd is also a Microsoft MVP and has become one of the most influential people in the SharePoint community. Just a little bit about Syskit. We are a software development company that creates state-of-the-art Office 365 and SharePoint Enterprise solutions for governance, administration, and monitoring. This year, Syskit is proud to celebrate 10 years and our customer base has grown to over 3,000 in over 75 countries worldwide, and many of whom are Fortune 500 companies. You may have heard of some of our products, including SP Docket, Syskit Insights, and we are proud to have just released our new web-based Office 365 governance tool, Syskit Point. If you have any questions about our tools or our company, please feel free to visit our website. And now, some important information for attendees. By tomorrow, we will send everyone a recording and slide deck of the webinar if you would like to watch it again. Following the presentation, we will have a short live tour of our newest tool, Syskit Point, by our Head of Engineering, Eva Etzig. Following the demo, Todd will answer as many questions as you can during our Q&A session, so please feel free to ask him anything you want through the GoToWebinar chat application. Now, without further ado, I will switch things over to Todd so we can begin the presentation, also known as the Todd and R. <laughs> Todd, <laughs> I will now make you the presenter so you can get started. I was uh, I was not made aware that that's what we call these now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, that was not uh, we did not practice that. Uh, so thanks to uh, to Demir for the introduction. I think he must have collaborated with my mom on that to kind of get all the important stuff about how important I am. And you missed the part about my uh, movie star good looks, but we can we can get that into the next one. Uh, thanks to everybody out there. I'm looking at the crowd. We got a huge crowd out there. I appreciate it. And thanks to Syskit for putting this all together for us. Uh, those of you that have been following me over the years know that I'm a big fan of Syskit. I've, I've known them since they were just a little baby company and I love all their products. So when they asked me to, to do this webinar, I tried to, I tried to be calm and slow played a little bit, but I was very excited. And this topic was an interesting one. So I'm, uh, I'm glad to be part of it. So today we're going to talk about the, the process that I go through and that I, I bring my customers through when we offboard people, uh, when they leave the company and how we uh, offboard them from Office 365. So I won't do as good of a job uh, talking about myself as, as Demir did, but I wanted to put this slide up. It's got also my email address. I'm on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter right now because I'm paying attention to this webinar. I want to do a good job. But after that, I'll go back and read all the tweets. You can email me at, at uh, todd.clint at simpraxisconsulting.com. I've, I've got a website uh, and uh, would love to hear from you. I'm a pretty social guy, so reach out if you've got any questions or anything. I put agenda slides in. I, I spoke at a conference a while back and they forced me to put an agenda slide in and it seemed kind of silly because I just kind of go off the cuff. But this is roughly the agenda that we're going to follow. I'm going to spend the first part of the webinar talking about what to do with users around the offboarding process. And, and it seems kind of silly that we have to talk about other pieces because we are talking about offboarding users. But in reality, there's a lot of things that you can do at your company around resources that will help you with offboarding users. So I'm gonna spend the back half of the, of the webinar talking about the individual resources, how you can be proactive when uh, to prepare for when users leave your company and, and other things like that. And I'm also uh, gonna be watching the questions. So if something comes up during this, if I, can, if I can fit it in, I would be happy to hear from you. All right, here is the first part we're gonna be talking about, the users. So, it's, it's sad when we talk about users leaving. Uh, I used to work for a, a big company and they do a, a new employee orientation at the beginning and it's, you know, it's everybody, it's all the new employees sitting in a room. We're all very excited about working at new big company and, and it's all, you know, very energetic and they bring all the different parts of the company in and get you excited. And one of the things that they did is they brought the founders of the company in. So it's very exciting. You're talking to the people that, that birthed this company. And one of the founders said something that was really odd. He said, every person in this room will have their last day at this company. 
which was kind of a downer because we're all excited about starting at this company. And this guy that, you know, he's like, well, every one of you is going to leave at some point, which was odd. But it was it was it was correct. And it really it, it helped out. I, I've since left the company. So he was right. He's he's at 100 percent on that so far. Um, but it is something that we need to plan for. It is inevitable. And we don't like to think about it, but we do need to plan for that. Everybody at your company will leave at some point. And so you need to have a good process in place for that when that happens. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. So as I'm talking about uh, the, the, the process, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have our, our protagonist, it's going to be Sally. Uh, Sally has, has worked at our company for a while. And whenever I talk about people leaving a company, the, when I was uh, a young, budding computer nerd and we would talk about this, we would always be, you know, you need to document this in case you get hit by a bus or something like that. I like to think of things in a more positive light. So Sally's not leaving the company because she was hit by a bus. Sally's leaving the company because she won the lottery. And because Sally is now a bazillionaire and uh, she just doesn't need to work anymore. She's going to gonna go buy herself a nice little island in the Mediterranean and live out her days uh, feeding grapes to monkeys or, or something like that. And so uh, that's kind of what we're going to walk through is we're going to talk a little bit about how your company uh, will we'll use Contoso, uh, how they're going to handle Sally uh, leaving the company and what things to do as she makes her way out. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is the user side, and these are things that you're going to do when they leave. So we're talking about their last day. Now, some companies, uh, depend, and again, depending on why people left the company, this can change. Sometimes when, when Sally comes in and she says, hey, I don't know if you've heard, I just won the lottery. I'm putting in my two weeks notice. Some companies will, will take that two week notice and give Sally two weeks to you know, hand her job responsibilities off, things like that. Some companies have a policy where they just terminate the employee that day, pay them for the other the, the two weeks. The piece that I'm talking about right now is their last day. What you know, this is so for Sally. They they split the difference. She stayed for an extra week. Uh, she kind of phoned it in because she's really thinking about the Mediterranean island and those monkeys. Uh, but she she stuck around, and we've had the big party for her in the break room. There was cake and all of that, and now she's uh, she's getting ready to leave. So what one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and we're gonna this is in storytelling. This is foreshadowing. We're going to talk about whether to delete the user or not, but don't do it right now. So when Sally leaves, don't go into whatever your you know user management tool of choice is and delete Sally. We're going to talk about some of those decisions uh, in a couple of slides. But what, there are some things that we do want to do right away. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to reset Sally's password. We want to change her password so that she can't log in either intentionally or unintentionally to company resources after she leaves. So intentionally is obviously going in and seeing how long she can get her email. But unintentionally is uh, Sally probably has a phone and a tablet and another tablet. And if she's like me, another tablet. And all of these things have been syncing to her work email. And we want to make sure that data doesn't accidentally get out of the company after Sally leaves by no intention of her own. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to change her password. And if we're doing this, uh, there's a couple of different ways people can get into Office 365. One of them is if they have a cloud account. So this is you've gone into Microsoft 365 admin, you've created an account and you are cloud only. You're one of those new hip companies that doesn't have a server room. Uh, the closest thing you have is a janitor's closet with a mop and a phone switch and all that. You are cloud only. Some other companies are still have on-prem resources. So they're they're keeping their users in Windows Active Directory or some other identity store and then syncing up to Office 365. All of these steps are the same regardless of how you're doing that. You just have to go to the right place to do it. So for Sally, we're saying that she works at a hip company. So they go into Microsoft 365 admin. They reset her password. It doesn't matter what the password is. Uh, we don't need to know what her password has been reset to, just that it's not the same as the password that she had when she left, so she doesn't get in. Now, if you do this through the UI, one of the very helpful things that the Microsoft 365 admin is going to offer is, hey, should we send their new password to them in an email? Under some circumstances, that's not the worst thing ever, though I do question sending passwords in email. But obviously, in this situation, we don't want to send Sally her new password as we're trying to keep her out. Uh, the next thing that we want to do then is disable the account so that she can't, uh, can't get in. Kind of, I'm as we talk about this, things that we do to protect the resources for the company and all that. I very much take a belt and suspenders approach to this. So you know, either should hold your pants up, but if you wear a belt and suspenders, the chances of your pants falling down are really, really low. And so by changing her password and disabling her account, we're further reducing the chances that she accidentally or intentionally gets in. 
if you go into the Microsoft 365 admin and if you're doing all this, if you go to the OneDrive tab for her users, there's an option for signing her out of all of the resources. I like to do that. Again, a belt and, res uh, belt and suspender sort of thing. By default, when a user or an application signs into Office 365, they get a token. And that token is what they use to get access for 60 minutes. And so this keeps their applications from having to send the username and the password 100 times as everything checks. They get this token. The token is good for 60 minutes. So potentially, there is the option that, that Sally may still have access to things for up to 60 minutes. Depending on why Sally left, whether she left after a big cake party in the break room or whether she was escorted to the door uh, with a box of her belongings, we may want to go out to PowerShell. And in the Azure AD module, there is a command that you can run, revoke Azure AD user all refresh token, and that invalidates all of her tokens immediately. So that is the quickest way to really kill every connection uh, that she's got. And also, if you're using Intune or any products like that, you also want to go into the devices and a remote wipe all the devices. So depending on what your policy has been on that, but if she's got a device that's got some company data on it, you may want to do that as well. Um, if you're doing all of this, if, you've, if, you're, if you're doing it in the cloud, you're done. If you're syncing with Windows Active Directory, then you will do uh, the first two bits, changing the password, disabling the account. You'll do that on-prem on your AD controller, and then those changes will sync up to Office 365. Now, by default, Office 365 syncs up like every three minutes, something like that, but there are a few activities that sync immediately. Changing a password and disabling a user are two of those, so that should sync right away. And, but if you really, really want to make sure that it syncs right away, you can run out to PowerShell on that box and you can do a start 80 sync sync cycle and that will kick it off immediately. So you really want to shrink that window that they can get in after you've uh, let them go. And speaking uh, about PowerShell, most of these activities can be done with PowerShell. Resetting a user's password can be done with PowerShell. Disabling their account can be done with PowerShell. Obviously the PowerShell that uh, revokes their token, well, that can be done in PowerShell. So this gives you the opportunity to create kind of a script, you know, a run book of offboarding a user. So you might have a, a, a script that you run. The value of that is several fold. Number one, it makes it uh, less likely that you forget any of the steps because it's all automated for you. It's also very self-documenting because you've got all the steps in there and you could also have your PowerShell script potentially log this to a file or a database or something so you can tell exactly when Sally's account was deactivated. Also, it gives you the ability to delegate that so you could have users that can run this without having to give them permission to log into machines and, and all these other things. And that can be done with Windows or with Office 365 uh, Active Directory, either one. So don't be afraid to, uh, to script some of this out, script the pieces out that you can. That will, uh, that will help with that. Uh, and if you want to wipe their devices, I think I mentioned that, you can do that in the, the Microsoft 365 Admin Center or the Exchange Admin Center, because there, there are some email pieces that you're probably going to want to do uh, as well. Another thing that you need to consider when you're uh, offboarding a user is their licensing. And the reason for that, well, licenses have gotten expensive. And if, especially if you're using things like Power Apps and uh, Flow, the product Power Automate, the product previously known as Flow, you want to pay attention to your licenses. Uh, and the, the you know part of the reason they're so expensive is that that's how Microsoft pays for all those computers and those data centers and all those hard drives and all that. And so we need to be aware of that. And you have a couple of options when you uh, deactivate a user how to handle their, their licenses. You can just remove the license from them and leave it in your pool. And then when you add the next user, when you hire Sally's replacement, though, you know, Sally, she was a hard worker. It may take two people to replace Sally. Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. But that leaves the license in the pool so that you can quickly uh, give it to the, another new employee. But you may not be doing that. Maybe Sally had been just kind of floating by and you're not going to replace Sally for a while. You can also remove the license from your tenant. And if you do that, then you don't pay for it anymore. So you pay for licenses, whether they're assigned to anybody or not. And as you're offboarding users, you want to make sure that you understand which of those paths you're going down. You can remove it from your tenant. You can go into, uh, in Microsoft 365 admin, you can go to billing and the licenses and remove it that way and save yourself some money. Or you can leave it in the pool, uh, give it to somebody else. There are some ramifications on how, when you, when you remove somebody's license that you need to understand. 
Um, if you remove Sally's license from her user, but don't delete her user, her OneDrive stays around. The OneDrive in SharePoint gets deleted as part of a cleanup process that the user profile service does when it notices a user goes away. So if the user's still there, but disabled and unlicensed, the OneDrive site will go away. As soon as that user goes away, then OneDrive uh, will, will get deleted. Email is another place where you have to worry about the licenses. When you pull the license off of the user, their email box will go away if it's not a shared mailbox. So, you know, again, know about all that. Syncing um, is another piece, and uh, again, I'm going to talk about here in, a, in the next slide whether we're going to delete the users or not, but short term, you're not going to delete the user. You're going to disable them for some amount of time. We're really just discussing about whether you're going to delete, you know, disable them for a week or for a year or forever or whatever. If you're syncing, like I mentioned in the previous slide, you make your changes in the Windows Active Directory, they sync up to Azure Active Directory. I've worked with some customers that they move uh, users who have left the company into a separate OU, uh, basically to, to keep it, you know, the active users easier to find. Sometimes they rename that user also. If you move that user to an OU that is not being synced to Azure Active Directory, at some point, Azure Active Directory Connect, the software that syncs the two up, will notice that. And what will happen is after three days, um, they will, their account in Azure AD, it's, it, it will it'll initially show up as a synced account. It will revert to a cloud-only account. It will stay disabled. The password will stay scrambled, but it will convert to a cloud-only account. So I bring that up so that you don't you get freaked out. You know, I, I moved them. Why are they still showing up? It converts to a cloud-only account in Office 365. Now, if you then do something, bring, uh, bring that user back into an OU that's synced up or start syncing up that OU, now we've got a situation where... On-prem, Office 365, or Azure Connect is trying to sync up a user called Sally at Contoso.com. But Office 365 already has a user called Sally at Contoso.com. And what happens then is Azure AD Connect, it's got a list of all the people on-prem and a list of all the people in the cloud. And it looks and says, hey, there's two Sallys. But wait, this Sally has the same UPN, user, profile, or user principal name, or the same primary email address. And it does what's called a soft a match, or if they have, uh, there's, you can anchor it to something else, or there can also be a hard match. But anyway, it connects those two users together, and it takes that cloud Sally user and connects it back up to a synced user. Uh, so you do have options for bringing them back on. That's going to become important in the next slide. So as you're doing um, uh, uh, those kind of things, keep that in mind. I see a couple of people mentioning they don't have any sound. Is that... Uh, Sound working for everybody? I'm hearing you loud and clear, Todd. Okay. All right. So Scott and Olga are having problems. We have to chat with them. Um, so make sure you understand the syncing uh, when you offboard people and, and where those changes happen. So as I've mentioned, uh, there is a decision tree that comes as to what you do with this account long term. Do you delete it or not delete it? Now, on my first slide, I had, you know, offboarding, parting is such sweet sorrow. I've got uh, to delete or not to delete. That is the question. I promise this is my last uh, bad Shakespeare reference. Um, before I did SharePoint, I was an Exchange admin and a Windows admin, and I've you know used uh, NT domains and Ac Active Directory and all that. And when people left the company, yeah, I just deleted them. And I remember the first time I ran across a company that did not ever delete users. I thought they were crazy. I thought you know perhaps there was some gas leaking into their office that was affecting how they think. Uh, and sitting back and talking with the, the people about it, they had a pretty good reason for it. And so I talked to them a little bit about it, and I kind of came around. And so now my default position is I don't delete users when they leave the company. And when I'm talking to customers, we talk about governance and all that. My default position is not to delete users ever, or certainly for several years, uh, after they, they leave the company. Now, that's not to say that that is always the correct answer. There's reasons we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes why that's that doesn't work, but that's the position I start with, and you kind of have to, uh, uh, you know, convince me otherwise uh, to to delete the users. So the, the, my my reasons for not deleting the users really come down to auditing and accountability, just really figuring out uh, what that user has done, what they've been, what their experience has been, and that's easiest if the user has not been deleted. So. 
part of the reason I say that I want to leave them in is because if we have some legal issue or, or something like that, if the account is still there and I want to go log back in and check their email quickly or go to the SharePoint start page and see what documents they were working on right before they left, I can easily reactivate that account, reset their password again, but now reset it to something that I do know and log back in as them. Now, there are, of course, there are ways to move email and files and all that, and I'm going to talk about those in the next part of the, the webinar. But those are a lot more work than just resetting the password, toggling that enable login, and just logging back in as them. So I, I like that, that easy way to get in and look at their data. We can recreate the account. So if we deleted Sally at Contoso.com, we certainly could go back in and create another Sally at Contoso.com. But in the background, both Windows and, you know, like on-prem SharePoint and Office 365, while the user may look the same, it may be Sally at Contoso.com, in the background, there's a hidden ID that is really how everything gets given its permissions. So on-prem, that is a SID, a security ID. And in the cloud, that's an object ID. And so even if I recreate Sally at Contoso.com, it's not going to be the same Sally. It's not going to have the same permissions that the old Sally had. I won't be able to just uh, enable that account, log into SharePoint, and see all the files that she had access to, uh, things like that. So having that same account, it maintains that SID, it maintains that object ID. So I am just going to jump right in as that same user. I really don't want to lose the audit trail on anything that she did. I don't want there to be any confusion when I do a search for Sally. Was this uh, the Sally that left, or was this the new account that we created for Sally? If I leave that account and leave that SID and all that in place, everything stays the same. When I first started dealing with this, it was with on-prem SharePoint. And where this really became a problem was not immediately, because SharePoint does have... Uh, you know, it, it pulls the user information in, writes it to the content database, so even if the user Sally gets deleted, everything still shows up fine. But where it starts to cause a problem is migration. So if we migrate from SharePoint on-prem to Office 365, the migration tools are going to try to match things up and figure things out. And if the user doesn't exist in both places, then it's going to end up being a default user, or it's going to end up being some unrecognizable name. Or even if we're doing it on-prem, if we're a migrating Office or SharePoint 2016 to 2019, depending on how our domain's set up and how SharePoint's set up, we may end up getting these orphaned users or get you know SIDs showing up instead of users. So I like leaving that user disabled in the AD so that no matter where that SID or that object ID goes, it can be resolved and we can... Um, we can track down what, where they went, what they saw, whether, you know, if they were the last person to touch a file, things like that. Another reason that I really like this is that it's easy to re-onboard. So our, our friend Sally, she's out there, she's in the Mediterranean, her and the monkeys are just having a wee of a time, but she misses all the people back at the office. She misses hanging around the water cooler and talking about the latest episode of whatever the people talk about at the water cooler, and she wants to come back. Not full-time, part-time maybe, but, but Sally needs, she needs that social interaction. So if we've just disabled her account, it's really easy to bring her back on board. We re-enable her account, we reset her password, she's already right back in, she's got access to everything, she hasn't lost any of her emails, any of that, and it brings it, it makes it really easy to go, to go back online. And it, it's funny, that this, this, this does come up just this week. I had a conversation with a friend of mine, and they had left a company, and a couple of years later, they're thinking about going back to that company. And so this you know, would be easy, bring them right back, uh, right back on board. Another thing that I like about not deleting the accounts is it keeps you from accidentally giving the same username or password to a new person. So if Sally leaves, uh, we, we, do, we get rid of all of her stuff, we delete her account, and a year later, somebody else named Sally comes on board, and we give them Sally at Contoso.com. She may by accident get emails that were meant for the first Sally. We don't want that. And so if we leave the old Sally in place, if we try to create the new Sally, System's going to tell us, hey, you can't uh, you can't use the username Sally, you can't use that uh, that email address, and it keeps people from accidentally getting things that they shouldn't. Uh, and the final one is, if you don't delete the object, then it's easier to handle some of the forwarded email issues that we're going to talk about in the resources part, OneDrive, and all of that. 
Uh, so it, it, it makes it a lot easier to keep track of stuff historically. And this, again, is very much dependent on your business. I've got some businesses that never want to lose any data. So they do this because they want to have every email that's ever been sent since the beginning of time, every file, every picture from the company picnic that's ever happened. So this works out well for them. I have other companies that are uh, in more legally sensitive industries, the you know, subject of lawsuits and things like that. So their legal department has a very... A uh, strict view on when data can be saved, how long data can be saved, and for them, this sounds horrible because you know, depending on how the legal laws are, things can get subpoenaed, and it's really ugly. So this is very much something that you want to talk to your legal department about uh, because they may have a, a very strong opinion about that. Um, so that's the don't delete camp. Now, what is the do delete camp? So when I have this talk with customers, a lot of times they stick their fingers in their ears. They don't like it because they have to delete accounts. And one of the reasons that they may have to delete the accounts is because of compliance. So there might be industry compliance if you're in finance or something like that. There might be uh, governmental compliance. Different countries have different information about storing or to have different laws about storing information about users. So for instance, it might be just flat out illegal for you to not delete Sally's account within a window after she left because by keeping her name and her number and potentially what her last password was, uh, you might be violating some law about her, her privacy. So make sure you know about that. Another thing is if you leave those accounts there, in some small way it increases your attack vector. If somebody, if you've got on-prem Active Directory, if somebody gets a hold of your user database, potentially that gives them more passwords to, to crack and figure out. Again, I really like the whole belt and suspenders idea. So even though the account's disabled, there's still it still increases that attack vector by just a little bit, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, and you do have a 30-day window to change your mind. So if you delete a user in Office 365, Office 365 knows that sometimes you, you regret these things, and so uh, it gives you 30 days to do that. So Mark Koo is asking, is it possible to stay GDR compliant and not deleting the users, especially if they are asking to be deleted? I am not a legal expert, uh, Mark Koo, but that is, a, that is a good thing to, to run past your legal department. It might very well be uh, against that. So you, you want to know that uh, because I don't, I don't want anybody getting uh, arrested <laughs> and more GDPR uh, questions. So yeah, so that if you're GDPR, if that's something that you fall under, you have to be aware of what your options are for that. So I like... Um, I like uh, I like knowing that discussion because I think it's it seems really obvious to delete their accounts, but after this other company talked to me about it, I'm like, yeah, that that makes sense. I could see uh, I could see wanting to keep them around. So those are the things that you do for your users the day that they leave. As Sally's walking uh, walking out with her her box of mementos in her hand, those are some of the things that you want to do. Now the whole reason that Sally is able to be productive at Contoso is because of the resources that she has access to. And so let's talk a little bit about how to handle those resources when Sally leaves. The first part about that we're going to talk about is, again, the things to do the day that Sally leaves. So we've talked about what to do the day that Sally leaves with her account, reset the password, disable it, potentially delete it. What do we do with all of the other things, the things that made Sally productive and a productive member of our, uh, our company? The first thing that we're going to talk about is files. So Sally uh, has files in SharePoint, and those are fine. We don't have to worry about those. All of the files that Sally, <laughs> Sally used in our team sites and our communication sites and all that, they just stay there. We're going to talk a little bit later about how we can help uh, keep track of all that and make sure that everybody can get in, but those files aren't going anywhere. However, her OneDrive files might go somewhere if her user gets deleted. And again, this is there's a, a timer job that runs in the user profile service, and when that notices that user goes away, then that that gets deleted. You can go back and and restore it, but you don't always catch that. I had a, a situation with a customer a couple of years ago, and this has played out a number of times. But they had an Excel spreadsheet that I swear the entire company ran on, and the entire company had ran on this Excel spreadsheet for years, and then one day it wasn't there anymore. Uh, somebody opened up Excel, the file was gone, they didn't know why, it didn't work, so the customer called me, and what we tracked it down to was somebody who was very pivotal in the company, had started the spreadsheet in their OneDrive years ago, had shared it out to a number of people, and that link had gone around, and then it was just in the most recently used files in Excel, and people completely forgot about it. 
that user left. And that user left, their user was deleted. Some amount of time later, the OneDrive was deleted. And so by the time this person realized that the spreadsheet that they needed was gone, the user that had shared it had been gone for some amount of time, weeks, whatever, they didn't immediately put those two things together. And uh, so that, that caused a problem. We ended up getting straightened it out. We were able to get the file back and all was well. That company has not gone under. But those are the kind of scenarios that you have to be worried about with OneDrive. So if you do delete the users, which will trigger their OneDrive to be deleted. Before that happens, you have a couple of options. Uh, so you, if, if everything is set up correctly in the user profile service, their manager will get an email about this and their manager will get assigned to it. But potentially that, uh, that doesn't happen correctly. So you want to go in and find the user's OneDrive. There's PowerShell that can do that. There are reports that you can do. And you want to give another user, their manager or a coworker, whoever's going to be taking their responsibilities, and give them access to that OneDrive. And so that gives them the ability uh, for some amount of time to copy those documents out. Now, in the case of my customer, the, the spreadsheet would have still broken because it wasn't in the location that Excel thought it was in, but we could have very easily found that file someplace else, copied it to a more uh, appropriate location instead of a team site, and the company would have not had to, to, to wait as long to get that figured out. So just know that they, uh, the OneDrive's got important stuff, far more important stuff than it probably should. So you want to make sure you have a plan in place for what to do when they leave with that. The other thing, and this is uh, not so much for Sally, because we like Sally. Sally's a good employee, hard worker. But sometimes, depending on why people leave the company, maybe you're a little worried about what they had done right before they left the company. And so this is where auditing uh, turns up. And if you go to protection.microsoft.com, uh, that's the security and compliance uh, uh, center there, you can turn on auditing. And after auditing has been turned on and running for a while, so that's something you want to do now, not right now, I mean, wait till the webinar is over, but soon, uh, go in and turn auditing on. And once auditing's been on, then when a user leaves, you can run a report as a tenant admin and just kind of see what they've been doing. And, and the things that you want to search for depend a lot on your industry and what the user had access to and things like that. But I have found that some good reports to run are what files they've shared, like in the last 30 days, what files they've downloaded in the last 30 days, what files they've deleted in the last 30 days, uh, and just what they've accessed. So, you know, what we want is we want to see, you know, did this person know they were going to leave? Did they share documents with, uh, you know, their home email address or some other email address that they shouldn't be sharing them with? Did they go through a week ago and download 100 files to their local hard drive, which of course could have ended up on a USB stick or something and, and, and exfiltrated? Uh, did they delete a bunch of things that they're trying to hide? Do we need to go back and, and recover those files? So that's all in the auditing uh, reports. Again, you have to be a tenant admin to run those, and you have to have auditing turned on before anything will show up in there. Um, notice in the chat room, uh, we got some stuff going on. Um, we'll look at, okay, so we get the audio problems figured out. Good, good. So I'm a SharePoint guy. Uh, I like SharePoint a lot, but email is also a pretty popular thing in Office 365. So I had to throw in a slide on how to handle email when they leave. So Mark Jones in the chat room had already mentioned that when customers leave his company, he converts their mailbox to a shared mailbox. Mark, I approve of that activity. Well done, sir. You can't see, but I'm doing the quiet golf clap right now for you. That's exactly one of the things. So you can, uh, in the Exchange Admin Center or with PowerShell, convert the user's mailbox to a shared mailbox, and that way it doesn't require a license, and that is free as long as that mailbox is less than 50 gig. So you'll, you don't delete the user, but you can remove their license, which makes it free, and then uh, the first 50 gig is, uh, is free. Another thing that I like to do, then obviously if you have a shared mailbox, you need to give somebody else permission to it. So again, this will be the manager or a coworker that's gonna be taking over their responsibilities. You may wanna set up auto reply on that mailbox. So if Sally's position with the company was something that dealt with a lot of external people, or if it's a big company and she dealt with a lot of internal people, 
you can set up an auto reply that says something like, hi, uh, Sally's no longer with Contoso. She's out in the Mediterranean working on her suntan right now. Uh, but uh, Fred in HR is taking over for responsibilities. So you may want to email Fred about whatever the thing is. Uh, and also make sure if you're doing it externally, you put that thing in the beginning. Your, uh, your business is important to us. That's always uh, people like that stuff. Uh, so you may want to set up an auto reply. Sally may also have aliases for other things that she did. Uh, you know, company picnic at contoso.com, whatever. So this is a good time to look through there and see if those are appropriate. And if they are, whether they should be with Sally or whoever takes over her responsibilities. Another thing that you may want to do is forward the mail that goes to that mailbox to another user. So if we know for sure that Fred is going to be doing all of the Sally tasks, instead of setting up an auto reply, we may just forward all of his, her email to him. And that way uh, he sees that stuff so no customers get dropped. They don't have to wait. Any of, that, uh, any of that stuff. We want to keep the customers happy. Another option we have with the shared mailbox is we can just copy that mailbox uh, to another mailbox, like a subfolder or something like that. That's kind of clunky, but that is an option. And then the most offensive um, uh, option up there, and I, I only put it there because if I don't put it there, somebody's going to put up in the chat room that they do it. Uh, so I wanted to, to head this off at the pass. You can then export it as a PST file, which is a gigantic, disgusting file that has to sit somewhere that all it wants to do is uh, crash Outlook and corrupt your email. So while you can do it, I wouldn't recommend it. This is like that whole thing, you know, you can teach a bear to dance, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. Uh, you can export all of your mail to a PST file, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't mean it's a good idea. Uh, in the chat room, uh, Kenneth asks, uh, if you have a shared mailbox larger than 50 gig, does it require a license? Yes, it does does. And I've got uh, some documents out here. When I send the slide deck to the Syskit folks, I will, I've will. i got some links in my notes that back up all of these amazing things that I'm saying happen. I'll, uh, I'll make sure those links are there so you guys can, can follow through with all that. Uh, Emmanuel is asking about what about in-place archive and in-place hold. So there are a bunch of compliance rules that you can set up retention rules and all that stuff. I didn't really want to get into all of that because I, I, don't, I don't deal with it a lot. I don't feel like I'm a, an authority on it. But again, that's another one of those things where depending on what your company does and what its legal requirements are, you may have some of these holds and in-place things. Uh, so those are another option for you uh, as well. Uh, James is saying that he showed up 15 minutes late uh, and he wants a copy of the deck. Uh, James, I can assume it's because there was a big fire that you were fighting and now everything's cool. But yes, you will get the slide deck from the Syskit folks uh, and it'll have all this in it. And by all means, show it to your management and to tell them that I bless all of this. And I'll, I'll write you a note if you need James. It's no problem. I, I do it all the time. Um, so another thing when your users leave, uh, there's the power platform. Oh, so another thing. Yeah, so all of these things that I talked about, uh, converting the mailbox and forwarding and all that kind of stuff. If you delete a user in the, the Microsoft 365 admin uh, console, it walks you through a bunch of these things. It walks you through the OneDrive bits and the Exchange bits and all of that. But again, if you delete that user, if it deletes the mailbox, then you can't do the forwarding and the auto-replying and things like that. Um, so there is the... Uh, power platform bit when they leave. So again, this is the point in time as Sally's uh, walking out. You wanna make sure you know what objects inside the power platform she owns and runs so that you can make sure that those are all taken care of. Uh, if there's any power apps that she's the only owner of, you wanna find those and assign those another owner, those kind of things. And I'm gonna talk about in a couple of slides how you can get, uh, get ahead of that. Um, okay. So we've talked about the things to do when Sally leaves. Now let's talk a little bit about the things that you can do today to prepare yourself for this. You can be a little bit proactive and save yourself some of these problems uh, before Sally leaves. I mentioned this before already. You want to turn auditing on. So you want to go to protection.microsoft.com and that will start auditing. This a uh, couple of down. So the auditing, I recommend that everybody turns it on. A couple of the downsides of this is it only saves like 90 days worth of logs. In the instance of offboarding, that's probably enough. If anybody was going to uh, do any kind of shenanigans before they left, they likely weren't planning ahead 91 or more days, so you're, you'll have enough for that. But just know that, that uh, that's a 90-day thing. The other thing is it's a, it's a small set of users that can do this. So tenant admins can do it. I believe there's a, a, a compliance role also that can do it. But you, it's, it's going to be one of those things where users have to contact IT and wait and all that. Uh, so plan that into your process. Uh, 
so one of the things that you can do, another thing after you turn auditing on, is you can make sure that every Office 365 group has more than one owner. And this is so that if Sally's the only owner and she leaves, there's still somebody who can go in and administer the, the, the group. Now, the group will still work. All of the files will still be there. Nobody will lose access to anything. But if a group needs to be changed from public to private or you know users need to be removed, things like that, you want to make sure that, that there's already somebody there that can handle that. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can tackle that. I had one customer. They have a site design that runs when a site is created. And one of the, the activities that that site design does is it adds a, an IT group as an owner to their Office 365 group so that no group isn't accessible by IT. Now, that, uh, that works pretty well because then the users don't have to remember it's the default site design for those sites and it just happens with some branding and some other things. They have discovered, though, that some of their users don't like that, and they go in and remove IT from the site owners group. And that's great. IT can play this cat and mouse game. You can run a site design more than once on a site without any problems. So they just have a scheduled task that once a week invokes the site design all over and adds everybody buddy, buddy, buddy back in as owners. So that's one way you can handle that. You can also run reports and look for groups that have only one owner, things like that. But that makes sure that you've, uh, you've got somebody you can get in. If you're not using groups on a SharePoint site somewhere, you can also do something to make sure that every site has more than one owner. Again, all the information is going to be there. It's just about management. Uh, and I have written in the past, I've written PowerShell scripts, usually using the PNP PowerShell. that will walk through all of the groups or all of the sites or whatever and find the ones that only have uh, one um, email. And so we're asking, what about private channels and their owners, which are not team owners? I have not played with that. Um, and Luther is saying that protection.microsoft.com does not appear to be live. It should be. It's the compliance site. I might have mistyped that URL. I'll make sure and get it in there correctly uh, uh, before I send the slide deck out. Uh, so again, uh, for those of you that have listened to my stuff in the past, I'm a big fan of PowerShell, and so I, that's why I keep... Uh, Keep bringing that up. Uh, so the other thing you can do, and this one, this, this is still maturing. This isn't exactly where I want it to be as an admin now. But uh, Power Apps and Flow, and by Flow I mean Power Automate, are hugely popular and only getting more and more popular as the days go by. And Microsoft is kind of struggling now with the whole self-service where users can pay for Flow or Power Apps themselves, which makes them even more crazy out there couple of things that I wanted to say about this. First off, even if Sally is the only owner of a Power App or a Flow, they will keep working after she left. So it's again, it's not like everything's going to break, but it is all about managing them. If a Flow needs to be changed after F Sally's left and she was the only owner, what happens? So we want to make sure that we have another owner in place before those come up. The Flows will continue to, to execute, so we don't have to worry about that again, but we want to add another owner. The flow connections might be a concern. So this is not the flow itself, but if there's some action inside of the flow that is running as Sally, that will break because that's going to be a thing that, that signs in and uploads a file to SharePoint or sends an email or something. So if you have a flow that is executing but not executing correctly, check for the flow connections to see if there's something that's using um, uh, an account that's, that's no longer there. This story is not very well fleshed out. So finding these and discovering these is tough. Both Flow, or excuse me, Power Automate and Power Apps have admin sites. And as a tenant admin, you can go in, list all the flows and Power Apps and, and find who the owners are, things like that. Um, I like to do it with PowerShell. So, and, and once again, the, the PowerShell is not fleshed out or as, and as mature as I would like it to be, but there is an admin module for the Power platform, and you can do get admin flow, get admin Power Apps, and it will list them all, and then you can pull in there and get uh, the ones that, uh, that, don't, that don't have a single user. And when somebody leaves, and I meant to put this on the other slide, you can also run that same commandlet, get admin Power App or get admin flow by username, and that could be part of the, the offboarding script that you run, and it shows you the Power Apps or the flow that the individual user owns. So then you can go sure, make sure that they have multiple users and all of that. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention is shared passwords, and this is very much because I'm an IT guy. Uh, 
there are a lot of things. Sharing passwords is a horrible idea, but 100% of the people do it. And this is this idea that you have service accounts or whatever that everybody in IT knows about. So if somebody in IT is the person that's leaving, you have to do all of the things that we've already talked about, but then you have to make sure that you roll all of your shared passwords. So before they leave, have a process in place for knowing how to change all of your service accounts. I had a situation I was doing an install with a SharePoint on-prem customer several years ago, and I was working with two individuals uh, remotely. We, uh, we were installing and configuring SharePoint uh, 2013, I think, and we came back from lunch and only one of them was on the call. And the, you know, we we're in the middle of configuring search or something. And, and he was like, hey, before we keep on that, uh, first, can you tell me how to change all of the service account passwords in all of our SharePoint farms? <laughs> so obviously the second person had been let go over lunch and we had to change all those passwords. So have that process down before this happens. Also, I'm a big fan of having all of your, uh, these kind of shared passwords in a password vault somewhere like one password or something, whatever your company has, so that you can have that shared place. You obviously want to make sure that the user that leaves doesn't have access to it, but there's a place where all those passwords are and, and have your password for roll or your process for rolling them over. Um, so that is all of that. I do want to spend a few minutes with my friend Eva. So Eva is the head of engineering at, uh, at Syskit and just a, a, a wonderful person in general. And she would like to spend a few minutes showing you SharePoint or Syskit Point and how it can help uh, help you keep track of some of these things. Eva, are Hi, you all John, warmed up? You. You're ready to go? Yeah, yeah thank you for a nice introduction. So you will share your uh, screen with me and we oh, can get started. Right. I yep. want to change the permit, you're right. Falling down on the job. Okay, just a second. Okay, perfect. So hello everyone and thank you for joining us and Todd, thank you for a really nice uh, webinar. So I'll try to be as short as possible, but I got this great privilege to show you our uh, Syskit point. Uh, it's the Office 365 governance platform. It's created for all stakeholders that are included in Office 365 governance. So we really wanted to create a tool that will be uh, able to use for every Office 365 admin, for site owners, for auditors, for consultants, for compliance officers. So whoever needs to be in charge of keeping control, taking care of permissions, and even onboarding. So let's see how Syskit Point can uh, help you in those tasks. Uh, first of all, the Syskit Point provides you with a complete inventory of your environment. You can see that we provide all the site details, Microsoft Teams, groups, and users. We also do the bulk reporting, so I will show you a couple of things about that as well. So if you go to the site, you basically get the nice, clean inventory of your sites. You can see who are the admins, just like Todd mentioned, that is really important. But if I go back to my teams, I can immediately see which of my teams have only one owner. So especially if there is only zero owners, then I really want to know that. And if I want to check who are these owners, I immediately get the report saying group members. And that's it. So now you have the details on which teams and groups actually have only one owner. So here you get to see all the members and owners. But if I filter by the owner, that's it. So I can see that Jonathan Smith has a lot of groups and teams, but he's the only owner. And that's definitely not a good practice. Okay, but when it comes to offboarding, how can we actually help you? So if I go to my users, I get the list of all the users. So I get to see all the external users, I get to see all internal users, and I get to see all disabled users. So just like Todd mentioned, the disabled users can, give, can be quite uh, often, especially if you don't delete them. So you can uh, also track specific types of users. Let's say that external users and administrators are the higher risky type. So I will check my administrators, and again, if I select John Wick, who is my admin, I can immediately track his activities and check what he's doing. So this is the audit log providing you with all the information that my John Wick has been doing in the last 30 days. Okay, uh, let's say that my employee, Quark, is leaving the company. If I want to see more details on his resources and what actually he's been doing, I will drill on the Quark. And that's it. 
So in one centralized place, you get all the information needed to see what your user has access to or what he has been doing in the last couple of months. You get the general info, of course, you get to see who uh, he was the manager to, uh, and what's really important, you get to see his OneDrive stats. So just like Todd mentioned, externally sharing is extremely uh, dangerous and it pre prevents uh, us, us to control the things in Office 65. So if I want to see what Cork has actually shared externally in his OneDrive, I click on this report, externally shared content, and I get all the documents that he's been actually sharing with someone. You can see that you can see the sharing links as well, but also the directly given permissions. And that's not everything. If you are not happy with how Cork shared this finance report, you can immediately remove the sharing link from the application. So I will do it. You get a little notification, and that's it. Once it's done, you get the latest report on Quark. That's not everything, of course. You can also see the complete content he's having on his OneDrive. Uh, if I click on a specific report, again, I'm interested in this finance report, I can stop sharing immediately. This will remove all the people who have access to, the, to this document and also restore inheritance. So I will have the clean environment and clean OneDrive of my employee. Okay. That's not everything also. So if you're not only interested in externally shared files, you can see the all files that have been actually shared. So like Todd mentioned, Quark probably worked with a lot of people. You want to know which of the files are the most active, who has been working with him. So here is the place where you can see everything. Again, this includes the directly given permissions, the sharing links, all sharing link types, and again, you can easily edit those permissions for all the users and all the sharing links. Uh, like Todd mentioned, when somebody is leaving your company, you really want to know what he's been doing in your environment. So first of all, I want to check all the places, all the teams and groups where he has been owner or member. This is this nice tile telling you. And if you want to see more, then you simply explore it and you get the list of all the teams where he is the member of the owner. So if Cork is a regular user, you don't want to have messed up environment, you can easily again remove Cork from all of these places. This will not delete him from your environment, but you will have clean teams and groups without any uh, users who have left your company. The same thing can be done for the sites. So basically this report, this style site, gives you a list of all the places where Cork had any access to. Even if Cork is the only owner, you will see this nice warning telling you that he's the only owner, you want, you want to check that. Uh, if you want to see more details, you can easily drill down to every file and see what your Cork, your employee, actually had access to. Uh, again, if you want to remove his access, that's easy to do with this remove action. Sometimes, when you are suspicious of what Quark has been doing, uh, you really want to check the audit logs, just like Todd mentioned. By default, the audit logs in Office 65 saved, are saved by uh, only for 90 days. In Syskit Point, you can save them much longer. So we save them to your desired storage. And then when somebody is leaving, you actually just want to check the user activity report. So this is the list of all the actions that Quark has been doing in your environment. This is for the last 30 days, you can do it for the custom period of time, as long as you have the audit logs collected. So you can see every action, you can see if he accessed the file, you can see if he deleted the file, you can easily uh, filter by specific um, properties. So if I want to check if he did something suspicious, I will check for the downloaded file and see that Quark has been really busy downloading all his OneDrive files. You don't want to have that. So you need to talk with Quark and see what he's been doing. Uh, of course, you can also see this uh, analytics, so if you are only interested in what Quark has been sharing, again, simply clicking on the shared files, you can see that Quark has shared a file with Jonathan Smith. You can see when and additional details. So this report will actually provide you a lot of, lot of information about Quark's uh, behavior, but also a lot of security information that you might need to take care of. So that's not everything. Like I mentioned, we also have a detailed report that can help you with your security and governance. For example, permission metrics will give you the, all the places and all the content 
for you to be able to keep control on who has access to what. A nice report is external users, so basically it gives you the list of all external users in your environment, and not only that, you can see where do they have access, and if I select a Dell, I can immediately see who actually added a Dell to my environment. So that can be done for any external user. And my personal favorite, uh, sharing links, that's one of the important ones. So if I want to check all the sharing links that have been going on in my environment, I will go to the sharing links report. I will select all of my groups and teams, run the report, and that's it. I'm getting the list of sh all sharing links, all types, and of course, I can also manage them. So there are other useful reports, there are audit log reports, but what's really important, so when I go to Quark, like I said, first of all, uh, you get to see his user activities for the custom period of time, longer than 90 days, but if I'm his manager, I don't have to be the global admin or I don't have to be a SharePoint admin to see that, so I only need to be his manager and I get to see the contextual audit reports for all of my employees, all the people who are in my team. The same goes for the auditing of the teams, so if I go to Microsoft Teams and I know that I'm especially interested in QA team, when I go here, Syskit Point will give me all the details on what's been going on in my team. So I can check the permission activities, who shares something, who broke the inheritance, and I can do the same thing for the file and page activities. So there are a lot of other useful options in Syskit Point. We are already investigating the support for private channels in Teams, so whenever you go to a team, you'll be able to see the list of all the channels, both private and standard, get to see the files, even if you're not the one who created the private channel. So we are just getting started, a lot of more is coming. I won't be bothering you, but if you have any additional questions or any suggestion for us, we are open for everything. So thank you for attention. I will now give back the word to Todd. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. I will show my screen again. Be very careful with the screen. Oh, phew, thank goodness. Well, it's always scary when I share my screen. I always get a little nervous. Um, so uh, there are a couple questions in the chat room, Eva, about whether you can use a syskit point with a government tenant and where the audit logs are saved, things like that. Do you have... Yeah, anything? you can use it with the government tenant. Uh, and the audit logs, you choose the storage location. So everything is in your environment. We have nothing to do with it. So it's your choice. Excellent. And Stacy Simpkins uh, would like to mention that this court guy seems kind of out of control. So yeah, I think, <laughs> you know, he, he yeah, downloads he a lot of files. We need to, to check on, but maybe get him some mental health, some some therapy sessions. Just a friend to talk to, a dog. I hear those help. He, uh, yeah, he was really wild and he has a lot of permissions. So you got a lot to, to answer for him. Yeah. yeah, so about 400 of you mentioned in the chat room that it is not protection.microsoft.com, it is protection.office.com. So uh, I think you'll have better luck if you go there. I will update the slides before I send them to the Syskit folks. So for those of you that were rushing right out to turn auditing on, thanks for your diligence, and I apologize for sending the wrong, uh, the wrong URL to you. Uh, Jurgen mentioned that he was interrupted a lot during this and was wanting to know if he would get the slides. Jurgen, you absolutely will. There'll be a link to the recording and uh, you know autographed pictures and all that, so don't worry about that. Adrian asked if turning auditing on will slow things down. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't think so. It all happens in the cloud side, so I think uh, I think you're going to be fine. I've never noticed any issues with uh, speed and auditing. Um, Tony is asking how my Trans Am is running. Well, it's running fine, Tony, but it's winter here in Iowa, and I put it away for the winter. Uh, but when I drove it last uh, here a couple months ago, it was doing great. Thanks for asking. Um, I think that is it. We've got a couple minutes for the top of the hour, so I think we'll wrap it up. I would like to thank everybody for showing up. This is a great showing. There's some great questions in there. And I could tell you were all listening as I said things that weren't true. You were very quick to alert me of that, so I appreciate that. Uh, and thanks to the Syskit folks for letting me uh, talk about this. This is a fun topic. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody, and have a good week. <laughs>